Uh, hello there. Um, I have a couple different poems, um, which I'll share here. Uh, one is, um, well, one I actually wrote on the uh, anniversary of the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, 1994. Um, for those who may, may not know, my brother was in the Air Force at the time. Um, so I wrote this one at a pro shortly after a protest in Madison back in January 1994. And um, it's called, How Do You Spell Ecocide? How do you spell ecocide? It's the free world's oil, said the US military. Mercenary of corporate plutocracy, pusher of petroleum addiction, porn flicks for the fighter pilots before they rape the Tigris and Euphrates. It only takes an F-15 30 minutes to burn 625 gallons, as much as a poor family's car uses all year. It only takes one gallon of oil to kill all the fish life in a million gallons of water. How do you spell ecocide? It's the West smart bombs, said the US government. Destroyer of sewage plants, ravager of health clinics. Camel corpses sprawled across sand dunes, mistaken for tanks by high-tech infrared scopes. It only takes 200 years for the Persian Gulf to flux to toxins from its life support system. It only takes one ounce of soot from burning oil to poison 300 square meters of cropland. How do you spell ecocide? It's the evil Arab despot, said the US mass media, peddler of Nintendo jingoism, spewer of soundbite hypocrisy. Saddam tortures pet cats and dogs, inquiring gullible minds are keen to know. It only takes a few billion dollars to liquidate several hundred thousand innocent civilians. It only takes a couple billion dollars to clean up the toxic time bomb the mindless arms race has created. How do you spell ecocide? A-P-A-T-H-Y G-R-E-E-D H-A-T-E U-S-A N-O I have a little bit of time. I think I'll share a couple more. <laughs> I don't know how many people have been sharing, but um, this is one I wrote right after the uh, demise of Mifflin Street Co-op. I don't know how many of you were at that meeting. Uh, I was actually there. It's one of the most saddest moments of my time in Madison. And um, so this was written on that, that evening after uh, the board decided to, the general membership meeting decided to close Mifflin Street Co-op for the last time. This was August 7, 2007, for those who don't remember. What if the revolution was convenient? The co-op lies forlorn and empty. In the dusty window hangs a plaintive sign. The revolution will not be convenient. But what if it was? What if it was easier to buy healthy, nutritious food that your children clamored for and enjoyed, rather than bowing to demands for Twinkies and Lunchables? What if it was easier to ride your bike for errands safely down the street in your neighborhood rather than muscling your SUV to a suburban big box? What if it was easier to run a grocery as a collective with empowered coworkers you trust and respect rather than people being dishonest stuffing tax bills in hidden corners? What if it was easier to support local farmers who direct market fresh produce in your bioregion rather than pleading for wholesale discounts from corporate middlemen? What if it was easier to be part of a co-op movement built around solidarity, mutual aid, and reciprocity, rather than a commodity market controlled by brokers and speculators? But as the saying goes, if you are what you eat, then I'm fast, cheap, and easy. No time to toss the king's tea in Boston Harbor or storm the Bastille to release some hapless prisoners. Better to just go home, kick back, put another Pop-Tart in the microwave, and watch YouTube. It's getting late. The meeting has gone on way too long. Everyone has thrown their rotten vegetables and cast their dispersions upon the decrepit co-op. Time to mount the auction block scaffold. Am I a witness to euthanasia or an execution? Scavengers wait in the wings to feed off the scraps of a once dynamic, creative, beautiful creature that has sustained this community for decades. Swords into plowshares, 
Cuisinarts into guillotines? Are we all victims of a wannabe revolution that proves itself to be just too convenient, inconvenient? But what if the revolution was convenient? Would you feel better the morning after? Um, and I'll, I'll just read one more. This was actually written, I don't know how many of you are aware that Lake Superior is now being threatened by a horrible, toxic, taconite mine project. Okay, for those of you who aren't aware of this, I would really encourage you to get involved in it because um, Lake Superior is a beautiful place and should not be sacrificed for corporate greed. And um, I was just up at Isle Royal recently hiking across the National Park there and enjoying Lake Superior and I'll, you know, it's something I, I, I will fight for. Um, I wrote this poem actually in the context of the last mining fight we had in the state about Crandon Mine, which some of you may have been involved with. Um, so I wrote this up at Mole Lake, which is actually where the mine site was proposed for. This is back uh, almost a decade ago now, that, or actually almost 15 years ago now that I wrote this poem. And it it's actually in honor of Walt Brissett. Some of you may know him. He's an uh, Anishinaabe activist who passed away a few years ago from the Red Cliff Band. Um, and we just had the Tribal Council of the Red Cliff here to confront our governor about this issue recently. So this is called Abe Lincoln Meets Walt Brissett Over Exxon's Dead Ore Body. And the, you know, the mine company back then was Exxon. Yeah, now it's a different one. But. And I should really have a penny to do this. Let me just grab a penny. <laughs> <laughs> it was inspired by a penny, because the, re the reason they were supposedly doing this was for copper. So this may or may not be a copper penny anymore, but it helps having a penny in your hand when you read a poem about copper. Okay, so, in God we trust. It was early dawn and it was on the road. With that familiar now some, somewhat tarnished profile, Good old Abe Lincoln. Yep, there's copper in them there, Northwoods. Too bad all that other stuff is in the way. Water weeds, swamp land, blanket asses. Still, if you hold a coin close enough to your eye, it can block out, can block out the entire sun. Bottom line blinders for the Exxon, as it does as corporate calisthenics. Roar, grab, gorge, growl again. Grab, gorge, growl again. Grab, gorge, growl again. I picked up the cast-off penny and placed it in my pocket. Soon enough, though, I could feel it burning a hole. Sulfuric acid oozing down, burning my leg, poisoning the water, following the earth, searing my soul. Last night I saw another well-known weathered face, that of Walt Brissett, Anishinaabe activist, Gaia guardian. His voice crescendoing in the campfire, his vision traversing seven generations. Everyone was there in solidarity. Old, young, black, white, twig, feather, fur, shell. Their strength and courage fueling the eternal flames, vaulting to the midsummer starlight, scattering to the four winds. Their home, our home, would be here long, long, long after the bloated Exxon beast belched its last foul breath of putrid profit. Exxon, what's that? The great, 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 great grandchildren of Walt and Abe will wonder as they frolic in the Northwoods. And corporate paleontologists will scurry to unearth evidence of the rumored monster. Where are the bleached bones? Where are the toxic tailings? And with a little luck and a lot of hard work, they'll find nothing, nothing, but a worn copper coin. E pluribus unum. Thanks.